black and white, beautiful portrait shot. The reality, not so black and white, but equally as beautifully. Oh, not so beautiful. I'm oh, sorry about that. Oh, come now, come now. I think that's a wonderful shot. It's a great photo, yeah, absolutely. But we're here at Dice. This is why this man's in this brochure. Sir, how are you today, and how is Dice being for you? Uh, first of all, I think the speakers have been fantastic. Mm -hmm. It was really, really cool. And uh, after every speech, I was thinking, wow, that's it, I got it. And then the next one came with a completely different perspective. And I thought, that's it, wow, that's so cool. So to me, it's been uh, hugely inspirational. No, great. We heard you at the, uh, the lunch table there, sort of nervously changing a few bits and bobs. Was that, was that work in progress, like you said, because you heard what you hung a fight yeah. against? Well, I, I was more nervous than I thought. So I'm, I'm normally not that nervous mm. about giving speeches, but uh, this time I was quite nervous. And also, the idea of my speech was to research mm -hmm. the idea of uh, Swedish and Scandinavian game development culture. And at lunch, I had the opportunity to meet a couple of more people who would kind of fill me in, and uh, they would add some bits and pieces that I still didn't have. So that's what I did during lunch. I was going to say, it was sort of a broader approach to this, this talk than most other speakers have brought, because they, they were very focused on their particular market. You were talking to everybody in the world, it seems, to discuss why Swedish developers are better. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I, I don't know if that is a question, or is that that's just a review? I'm, I'm not too sure, I was going to say, because you, you are saying that Swedish, Swedish developers are not necessarily better, but there's reasons why they're perhaps perceived to be within the uh, industry. Well, I would argue, yes, that that's mm. the case. I think that there's a, a kind of a foundation of mm. very, very good conditions that allow... It, it's not just games, to be honest. It's Skype, it's Spotify, it's a lot of software development that mm. is coming out of Sweden that is very, very good uh, and has a very high international quality. And I, I got curious about, you know, is that just uh, luck or is it not true mm. or why did it happen? So in the speech, I try to research it. I thought it was very interesting you sort of brought up the fact that you don't like the sort of cultural stereotype, yet the complete contrast between what you considered Swedish developers to bring was completely different to what other people thought. Yeah, about Swedish I mean, developers. cultural stereotyping yeah. is, is uh, to be honest, uh, it, it's horrible. Mm -hmm. It's not a good thing. Uh, and I don't want to be uh, the bad guy. Uh, but the question was asked, and mm -hmm. I took it upon me to answer it. And of course, you end up talking about cultures and people from different nations. Uh, due to the nature of the speech. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think the thing that amazed me the most was that if I had to make the speech up before I spoke to anybody, I would put number one, uh, honesty. Mm -hmm. I think that's a typical Swedish trait. And mm -hmm. people are very honest, sometimes blunt, sometimes brutally honest. Mm -hmm. And to my surprise, when I talked to people from other countries, they said, yeah, you guys are really hard to read. <laughs> and I was like, what? What is hard to read? We just say what we think and mm -hmm. that's it. And you know, the janitor will come into me and say, David, I think you're doing a really bad job because so and so, and I think perfectly fair. Mm -hmm. You know, he has a valid point. So to me, I thought we were very honest, and I, think, I still think we are, but apparently it doesn't really translate into other cultures. And there were a couple of other mysteries like that that kind of uh, confused me a little bit <laughs> in this speech. Do you, find, do you find that feedback happens within the studio? Because I know you're saying with, with Swedish development, it's like 30% of the workforce is from other countries, other nationalities. I mean, is that, is that the same within Massive as well? We are, I think, at 35% mm -hmm. international workforce and from over 30 different countries. Mm -hmm. uh, not all of these people will discuss with me, <laughs> but, but, but some of them uh, come into my room and they say, hey, Dave, explain this Swedish thing. Mm -hmm. I don't get it. You know, this is just confusing. And what they most often find confusing is probably the... Uh, the inclination that we mm. have to challenge authority uh, or title or any type of uh, old merits. Mm -hmm. To us, it doesn't mean a lot. So even if you were the game designer on World in Conflict and everybody knows it's a great game, everybody loves Magnus, who was the creative director on that game, mm -hmm. it doesn't mean that he's good today. It doesn't mean that he's important today. So he has to come up with uh, new ideas that are just as great and he has to be as good as he was then or better uh, and to us that makes sense mm -hmm. but this is apparently quite confusing to a person from another country where they expect you know my career is uh, I build upon my mm -hmm. legacy and I gain uh, influence mm -hmm. based on my uh, old merits mm -hmm. and we're like yeah but old merits that's 2007 it means nothing today we think and to us I think that's a perfectly valid challenge but as I said that seems to be where uh, most of our expats mm -hmm. get confused 
Well, I thought, I thought it was a, a very good point, valid point, where the person's only as good as their last idea. And that idea, that, that a great idea can come from someone brand new to the company or someone that has been there for ages. But I'd like to know, how, how does that work? How do you see that working within the sort of daily dynamic or even the weekly or monthly dynamic within a studio where everybody's contributing? Uh, that's a great question, and uh, I, I think the truth is that it doesn't work hmm. all the time. Uh, a lot of new guys feel intimidated or uh, maybe they don't feel that they're being heard. Uh, a lot of the old guys think that they should have some kind of uh, advantage over the new guys because they've been there a while. So I, I think in reality it's uh, difficult to make meritocracy work. But what I always say is that the alternative is no good. You know, having a democracy, which is the most popular feature, win, doesn't necessarily mean it's the best one. Or dictatorship is a horrible solution. So the only alternative we have is going back to meritocracy and trust the ideas to guide us to the, to the right decision. You say then that there'd be more pressure then on the higher ups in the company because they've got to that point, so everyone is looking to them to come up with the best idea rather than the new guy off the block? Uh, I, I think that the pressure on the mm -hmm. people higher up in the company is to remain open-minded. Mm -hmm. uh, because of course if you've been in a job 10 or 15 years, you uh, have habits, mm -hmm. you have a pattern, uh, you have choices, you have you know a bunch of people that you trust since uh, before. And I think the challenge we have is to remain open-minded and to realize that the answer tomorrow may not come from the same person as it did yesterday. Mm -hmm. I think that, that's really where it's difficult. Okay. I, lo I love the idea that you had with um, the idea that is company spends or team spends two to three years making this great game and you keep that team and carry on and you yep. learn and everything like that. But where's the, if not conflict, that's perhaps the wrong word, but the, the, the sort of uh, flip side of it of you try and refresh, you try and create these an influx of new ideas, but you're trying to keep that core team who have the experience there to create these products and have learned from that previous cycle? Uh, gre uh, an another great question. <laughs> uh, you should do this for a living. <laughs> uh, I see about it. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, the way I see it, the, um, the amount of challenges that you get in a game project uh, is very, very high. I mean, there's an enormous amount of challenges that you have to face and mm -hmm. deal with. So you don't need more tension. Mm -hmm. uh, you need stability. You need organization. You need people who have been there before, people who trust each other, mm -hmm. people who have been in complicated situations together, and they know, I know what's going to happen to you when you're under pressure. I know what's going to happen to me. Uh, and we can build on that trust uh, to face the new challenge. So I, I don't think you need, in this industry, I don't think you need more tension or mm -hmm. more innovation. Uh, I, I think maybe we need less, to be honest. Mm -hmm. I, now this is paraphrasing horribly what you said up there on, on stage, but the idea of you, you build up that relationship with people through trust rather than trusting people with power. You, you feel that trust is, is the core component, or at least one of the core components that make up a great development team and by association with great game? Uh, totally, yes, mm. I do. I, I think, uh, as I said, it's a very complex business to mm. be in. And as was pointed out by other speakers, mm. it's a, there's a lot of change going on. Uh, it's easy to be afraid mm -hmm. and fear, as Yoda said, is uh, <laughs> no good uh, guide. Uh, and I, I think trust is the best way to counter uh, some of the f uh, challenges we're facing. Okay. Now you guys introduced the division, E3. Um, great response. It's that sort of AAA product that people are expecting from next-gen consoles. How have you guys, within that period between then and now, I mean, absorb that reaction, absorb that feedback. I mean, has that cha challenged you or altered perhaps what you guys have been doing currently, perhaps what you're going to be doing in the future with yeah, the game? Absolutely, and, and, and I think in a very good way. I, first of all, I think for the team back home who are mm. really doing all the hard work, <laughs> I'm not. Yeah. They, uh, they had been developing this project in a bunker mm -hmm. for so long, and it was supposed to be secret, and it, we managed to keep it a secret until the announcement. But it also means that you're working in an environment without feedback, which is not good for a mm. game. Uh, and I, I think we didn't really know how good the game was or if some of our choices were right. And when we were allowed to announce it at E3, we finally got confirmation that some things worked. Some things worked a lot better than we thought. Some things nobody noticed, mm -hmm. apparently not as important as we thought. But the feedback was tremendously important. And I think the, uh, the team really, really needed 
a huge vitamin injection of mm. external feedback because we'd come to the end of what we can uh, make up on our own mm -hmm. uh, without existing in a context. So the context provided us with a lot of interesting feedback and definitely right now is a phase when we can react to feedback and we can listen to what people say. I, I think the PC announcement we uh, made at Köln was a great example where we thought, you know, uh, no time for PC, it's not important enough, let's not try to do it. But everywhere we went people were saying, great game, but you know, you have to do PC. And we realized they're right, mm. we have to. Uh, so we built that into our dev plans. It's not going to be make it any easier. <laughs> uh, but for sure, it's a, it's a good reaction from the fans. And I think we, uh, it's just one example. I think we will have more as we move forward. Because to be honest, the last six months, you're not open to feedback mm -hmm. very much. You're, you're so late in the production line and you need to complete the game. Mostly we're chasing bugs yes. the last three months. So. Uh, there's not much to do no matter how intelligent the feedback is. But now is a time when the window is open. The dialogue, uh, the conversation mm. is very, very welcome at this point. I thought it was what Lauren said, uh, the, the co-founder for All World Inhabitants, during his talk about talking to the consumer, taking that feedback from the consumer, almost putting it out there saying, what do you guys want to see? And that air that perhaps that is maybe needed these days to ensure that a product will sell as best as it can. but. There's that fine line between hearing what fans expect and what fans want, and then you guys go, no, no, there has to be a line drawn. Like you said, intelligent feedback at times, but maybe there's not enough time or it sort of deviates from what you guys had as a core idea for the actual game in the first place. I, I, I mean, that remains to be proven, I think, but mm. we, we do hope to be uh, extremely close to the, to the gamers. Mm. Uh, and I think in particular, the hardcore fans who spend the time to analyze what we're doing and when they come with feedback and ideas, even if it's negative, even if it's harsh, it's based on a good analysis. Mm -hmm. And that feedback is really important to us. So you know, to me, it's like running a shop. You, you want to meet the people who are entering your shop. You want to know what they're talking about, what they're thinking about, what products they want. Uh, to me, it's, uh, it would not work to be without that dialogue. Mm -hmm. Now, you've been walking the stage today, but there has been other speakers. Have you? been sitting down in the audience listening to them, is there any particular ones that have resonated with you, surprised you? Uh, well, first of all, I, I think the range of speakers was fantastic. Mm -hmm. uh, and as I said before, they approached the idea uh, or the topic of games from so many different uh, lenses mm -hmm. that to me it was hugely inspiring. And uh, I, I think, you know, <laughs> uh, there is no point probably in pointing out any winners, I don't think. Uh, but. Um, the ones that resonated the most with me in particular, but it also depends on my background. Uh, I, I think Hilmar's description of where games are going and where games, what games could be uh, was incredibly bold and almost bordering on the political and the religious, which I'm almost, I, I'm a bit envious of him that he dared to do that because I would normally stay away from going into religion or politics, but, but he did. Mm -hmm. And I, I think he succeeded with it, which was really, really impressive. And then Paul was interesting to me because he's been going through a transformation, f coming from being a dictator at splash, the yeah. splash damage and realizing this isn't working. And then you know doing a 180 and becoming a completely different type of manager was really cool for me because in the end he's arrived at conclusions that are very similar to mine uh, about how to run a games company and how to have a very creative and productive environment for craftsmen. It's good to ha actually have that honesty. Whilst the idea of the summit is to express those sort of ideas, it's quite it's one thing to say that, and another thing to see someone stand on stage and go, "Yeah, like he said, I was a dick at that particular time, but I've learned from that experience. And I want to transfer that information across to you guys that perhaps you can use it better." Yep, uh, that was uh, great. I mean, and I, I've done the same at uh, a speech I gave in Newcastle, mm. where I took it upon myself to talk about my biggest failures. But, but in the end, when I was on stage, I found it quite uncomfortable. And I thought, maybe I shouldn't talk about this. Maybe that's not such a clever investment mm. in my career after all. Uh, and because I have that experience, I, I have you know, twice the amount of respect for what Paul did, uh, admitting you know, that I wasn't good at that time. This is how I learned uh, by failing. Mm -hmm. Uh, that was really well done. Well done, absolutely. Like a setting like this, it's actually a good opportunity for everyone to sort of reevaluate perhaps their own approaches as well as their own thoughts on it because you're having to do it to a particular audience. Yeah, and it, to me, it's an interesting time in the games industry because either we talk about how do we make money on games mm -hmm. or we talk about how to create great games. 
And for me, it's all about creating great games because if you're able to tell a great immersive story, mm. uh, people can make money on that. That's been working for thousands of years. You know, that's a model that we understand. And I'm personally quite concerned that there's so much talk now about how to make more money uh, or what is the right business model because I'm thinking, yeah, but you know, the right business model to me is to have uh, a great product. Mm. That's the only business model that I believe in. So in that way, I, I feel particularly, I think, encouraged by Hilmars and the Paul speeches. More John Lennon than Donald Trump then? More, for me, <laughs> more John Lennon than Donald Trump, but I'm also old enough to realize how these things need each other. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not, they're not mutually exclusive either. Mm -hmm. But for sure, yeah, John Lennon, absolutely. <laughs> Listen, thank you very much indeed for taking the time yeah, to talk. Thank to you. It's a pleasure. Yeah.